Our final presentation is on film grain and film scanner noise in HDR video from Mr. Michael Douglas Smith. Uh, Mr. Michael Smith is a digital imaging, cons sorry, digital imaging consultant for various major Hollywood studios and is currently is co-editor of JPEG 2000 High Throughput Image Compression Standard. In 2018, he received a screen credit for his color science work on Mary Poppins Returns. He was editor of the book 3D Cinema and Television Technology, The First 100 Years, published by Simti in 2011. He also consults for attorneys for intellectual property and has worked more than 35 matters, which has resulted in payments of approximately $1.7 billion. He received bachelor's and ma master's degrees in electrical engineering from UCLA. P please welcome Mr. Smith. Uh, okay, so yeah, so this is about film grain. Uh, I work with Mike Zink uh, at Warner Brothers also on this. Um, it's exciting stuff, so let's get into it. Um, so let's see. So uh, the motivation for this work is that um, while remastering a film, a film-based title for HDR, talent saw noise that they weren't familiar with that they never saw in SDR. Uh, and so that kind of was puzzling. What is this noise? Uh, a test of an HDR remaster from a film negative and a film inner positive uh, resulted in different noise characteristics in the bright uh, part of the scene. Um, and so advanced noise reduction can be used uh, to mitigate some of this stuff and it can lead to acceptable results. Um, but questions remain of why are we seeing this noise in HDR that we never saw in SDR? Um, can the noise be reduced or eliminated with different scanning techniques? And is the noise different in bright or dark areas? So it's kind of a lot of material to cover here. Um, I'm going to give a little overview of film workflows and then talk about how to predict changes in visibility of image data in SDR and HDR. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about our test films and the scans. Um, and then a process to eliminate and isolate noise using a median, um, basically an average uh, operation. And then do some analysis of the noise characteristics in those test elements and uh, also then predicting visibility in SDR and HDR. So, um, <coughs> so this is a film workflow, traditional film workflow like old film workflow. Um, basically there's four generations of film in a normal process. There's the original camera negative which is what's exposed on set. There's multiple takes that are taken of a scene. And the, in editing, the editors pick the scenes they want to include in the final uh, movie and they make a cut list. You take the camera, the negative camera rolls, cut them up and, and glue them and tape them together. That's the, the negative assembly. Then you have this final uh, original camera negative uh, cut negative. So the cut negative then is color graded. Um, where you make uh, an answer print with, uh, you go through different iterations here to adjust the color balance of the shots and also adjust the creative uh, look of the picture. Um, that makes an inner positive, which is now the second generation. That's a positive image. So bright parts of the scene are bright in the positive and dark parts of the scene are negative, uh, black. That inner positive then can be used in telecine to make a a DVD master or something like a D maybe later DCDM or DCPs. But usually what happens is uh, in, in the old days you'd make a duplicate negative from that inner positive and then make release prints from that um, inner, uh, inner negative or duplicate negative. So the release print was four generations from the original camera negative. In a modern film workflow, basically the IP is eliminated um, and uh, you, have, you still have the same film on set. You still um, expose that, but now it gets scanned by a scanner, uh, goes into digital editing, um, an EDL comes back that says which, which scanned elements uh, to include in the conform. Uh, sometimes that, can, that, that list can identify the key frames that are then could be rescanned at higher quality. That often doesn't happen, uh, and those faint frames go directly into the color correction. The, 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 you can also identify frames to do VFX on, so that can also happen. Final VFX come in here. And then uh, color correction happens uh, where you make output DPX files that then get recorded to 
uh, a duplicate negative to make release prints. Um, and in, in the modern era, that goes through the, the output files get processed by what's called a film print emulation LUT, which makes it so the pr projected digital image matches the same uh, color as the projected film print. Um, and that goes out and makes the DCP uh, ultimately, which gets shown in wide release. So uh, that's a modern film workflow. So both basically involve, um, so, so the old workflow didn't have scanning and the new workflow obviously does. But um, the old workflow had this inner positive. And so the vaults of the Hollywood studios are full of these things. Um, of, co of course, the negative and the inner positive are the higher quality elements because they're farther up the chain. Um, so those are usually used to do remastering. Um, so, so now I um, can try to talk about the technical side of how to predict uh, visibility of changes in source material. Um, <coughs> so uh, here what we have is uh, an output transform of how to convert a film scan uh, into output luminance. And I'm, here I'm using the, um, the ACES framework for this work to do this output transform. Of course, each production could vary and it would adjust it differently, but it's a baseline uh, good starting point. So uh, what's plotted here is the DPX 10-bit code value coming out of the, the scanner and then the output luminance that act actually is shown on the screen. Um, in SDR, there's the, the blue line basically starts at black and goes up and, and tops out at 100 nits for SDR. Um, in HDR, that would go up to 1,000 nits, for example. Um, and uh, what you can see is the slope changes here. And this is basically, there's very little changes in the high values for SDR, but the, the changes keep happening in SDR, uh, HDR. And so <coughs> I'm, I'm just looking at two values next to each other, 800 and 801. So we're talking about values over here. So if you look at the output luminance of those uh, image data values going through all these transforms, you get uh, 88.5 nits for 800 and 88.6 for 801. So that's a, a tenth of a nit change in, the, in a single code value in the image, image data. In HDR, that same exact data would turn into one, a one nit change. So that's um, a, a big difference, obviously. Um, so now trying to connect this into some visibility models, uh, we can calculate the what's called the modulation, which is the maximum divided by, uh, minus the minimum divided by the maximum plus the minimum. So in this case, that's six ten thousandths for the SDR, and in HDR, it's, it's two uh, th thousandths. So um, <coughs> now, this is a plot of the uh, contrast modulation um, that comes out of the Barton uh, contrast sensitivity uh, function. And uh, that is a complicated uh, visual model that tells you, for a given luminance and frequency, what's the uh, minimum amount of change in luminance that is needed to be able to see the change. Okay? So, now, so we have, uh, this is the modulation that I calculated. So that modulation of, of a minimum detectable change comes out of the Barton model. And that's parameterized by luminance and frequency. So here, there are two different luminances because there's 88 nits and, and 291 nits. Um, and there, if you look at the different frequencies possible, this could be any kind of imagery. Um, and the, the sensitivity would change over that, time, uh, that range. So the dotted blue line is the SDR detection threshold and the dotted red line is the HDR um, detection threshold for this um, input stimulus. Um, so, so, so basically what you see here is the, the SDR uh, modulation is below the blue, blue dotted line for the whole range of frequencies. Um, now spatial frequency is just like image detail. So if I have a, if I have a one pixel black, black and white transition on a screen like this, if you're three screen heights away, that's about 30 cycles per degree. So that's where the, the plot ends over here. Um, and so for, for, for HDR, uh, the modulation is higher, and the modulation threshold is actually um, 
it's, it, so this, this modulation of this change is below the threshold for the low frequency and for the high frequency, and it's, 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 sorry, it's above the threshold and below the threshold in the middle. And so what that means is, is a, another more simple way to actually look at this is to uh, divide the modulation by the modulation detection threshold. That then gives you um, what you could call a just noticeable difference. And so um, if the just noticeable difference is less than one, that means it's not going to be visible. If it's higher than one, then it may be visible. Um, depending on uh, various factors. So um, this, is, this is basically showing the same story, which is that in SDR, this change from 800 to 801 would not be visible uh, under any frequency, uh, at any frequency. But in HDR, it would be visible for mid frequencies because it's above one, um, and it would not be visible for high or low frequencies. Okay, so that's the background on how to bring in changes in image data into visibility predictions. Um, this is now more about the Barton model, just quickly, to basically show the dependence on frequency and luminance. So the different lines here are different luminance levels. The magenta line is the highest one, and the red line is the, the lowest luminance. What's interesting is the uh, peak sensitivity occurs at different frequencies depending on the luminance. And so that's what this dotted, this dot here is showing the, the peak sensitivity uh, of at each luminance, and it changes for, per frequency. Um, peak sensitivity is, is at low frequency for low luminance, um, and it's at mid frequency for medium to high luminance. Another way of looking at this is to look at it in terms of uh, to sort of take the same information but plot it differently, and you can have contrast sensitivity versus luminance for a given, uh, and each line is a different spatial frequency here. So this is the same story, which is that the red lines are the, the low frequencies. They dominate at, lo at low luminance, and the blue lines are mid frequencies, and they dominate at high, high, uh, mid, at high luminance. Um, and then high frequencies fall off here. Um, so, so now um, we can take the full range. Instead of just looking at code value 800 and 801, we can look at all the changes if we step from 0 to 1023, and try to look at how those changes relate to visibility. Um, and so for HDR and SDR, those are the red and blue lines. Um, and then the, the maximum sensitivity is the magenta line. And if I plot the, the, um, the, thresh, the threshold um, detection threshold for uh, 10 cycles per degree, it's higher than the maximum, um, and that's the cyan line. So, uh, to summarize, for high frequencies, 10 cycles, degree, 10 cycles per degree and higher, the SDR modulation will not be visible at any luminance, but the HDR modulation will uh, for um, s some of the range. For, for the lower frequencies, the, H the SDR um, modulation is not visible above uh, 700, uh, 70 nits, but the HDR modulation is basically visible across the whole range because it's above the, the purple line here. So um, now then bringing that back to the code values themselves, um, we can look at the um, number of JNDs uh, for a one change, a single code value change across the code value range uh, for both low frequencies uh, for the CSF max uh, on the high side and on the low side is the high frequency. So the same story is that uh, SDR modulation will not be visible across any of the code values for um, high frequencies, um, and it may be visible in the mid-region for um, HDR. In S and for low frequencies, the SDR visibility drops below one JND above code value 700, um, and the HDR is, is quite high above there. So that's the background on the visibility stuff. So um, now, um, okay, doing all right on time. So the test materials. So. Um, what we did here was we got a piece of film. Um, Kodak sells this thing called a control strip that's on color, um, color negative film. It's 100 feet of, and this, this is on 200T stock. And those, and it has basically patches of, of different densities. <coughs> and so we, we took that negative um, and then we made a dry IP, uh, uh, inner positive from that, and we made a wet gate IP, which is basically something that uh, is a different process. You put the two 
piece of film in a liquid that has the same index of refraction as the film base, and so it reduces surface defects. Um, so those are the, these are our three types of film. Um, now we then scan these films, um, and uh, unfortunately the scans, here's frames one through 31 of a scan, of a set of uh, the scans. The, the patches don't line up on frame boundaries, um, and, and then they repeat. So what we did was we rebuilt the, the strip by stacking all these scans together. So it was basically like 20K by 2K um, here. Um, <coughs> unfortunately, again, the, the patches didn't line up with the frame boundaries in the four perf uh, scanning order. So we basically didn't want to do any analysis of discontinuous patches. So we figured out which, which patches were continuous and threw those away. And now we have uh, some nice patches that we went and cropped um, that were continuous. And basically we had 45 to 51 continuous patches in 128, 124 different strips of um, film. And uh, so to simplify, we just used the first 45. Um, now, these patches weren't spatially aligned. So what we did was we did translation compensation to kind of align these patches so we could compare them. Um, we only used pixel precision here because we didn't want to generate new data. Uh, from, we wanted to use the data directly from the scanner. The results might improve a little bit if we did fractional pixel compensation. So here's our complete data set that we had. Um, <clears throat> so we had three types of film with 17 pat patches of different density on 45 strips uh, here. And then we had 49 scans of those elements. So we basically had uh, 49 scans of these 100 foot rolls of film. Uh, and there's three different, different um, films. So it's about 200 terabytes of this data. Uh, sorry, two terabytes, excuse me. Uh, two terabytes. We threw away about 60% uh, of it, like I explained. And, and uh, anyway, so this is our data set for analysis. Um, it took a lot of work to get the data in a pro place where we could get it to be analyzed. So now I'm going to talk about this median statistic um, to eliminate noise. So <clears throat> one of the things that was sort of the assumption of some of this work was that every scan of film that exists has film grain and scanner noise. And they often get both combined together of, oh, that film grain stuff, that stuff, you know, and, and you, you hear people talk about it. But there's actually two noise sources. And so um, we assume the scanner noise is zero mean, and therefore taking the median across all these scans of the same exact piece of film uh, can eliminate the scanner noise. So this is what that looks like. So this is the same piece of film scanned 49 times. So it's on a loop of 49 frames playing here. It's zoomed in, but that dancing stuff is the scanner noise. So it's pretty surprising, but there it is. <coughs> so this was always, you know, every scan has both grain and noise in it. So there's also some structure here which has, gr so this, this grain, there's grain and uh, a background image actually. Um, so that's pretty neat. Um, so if I subtract out that background image, I then just get the scanner noise. Uh, sorry, if I subtract out the median, uh, so if I subtract out this, this thing over here, which is the median with no scanner noise, from the scans, from each individual scan, I get just the scanner noise. So now this is, this is the scanner noise and nothing else. There's a little bit of artifacting, uh, but that's due to, I think, some of this pixel um, precision thing. Um, but that's pretty neat, too. So we, our process now is going to analyze this noise. And we have, of course, this is for one of the patch patches. This is for the mid density patch. We have high density patches, patch one, two, three, four, and low, den len low density patches, patch um, 15 through 17. That's for the IP. For the negative, it's the opposite. The density is flip. Um, so, um, so now uh, we can use the median of multiple scans of multiple strips to eliminate the grain and scanner noise. 
and so this is basically the same assumption. Film grain has zero mean. Um, now we can take, we have basically, we can look at the 2,000 samples of this one patch uh, corner and generate a median of that and that's free of gra grain and um, scanner noise. Um, that will just be a noise-free image of the scene itself, assuming the scene didn't move. Um, in this case, the scene is our patch density, but it would be a mountain or a face or an actor or whatever. Um, so what does that look like? So using the median of multiple scans of multiple strips of film to eliminate uh, the grain and scanner noise, you can see this is the background image. That's the structure that comes from however this process control strip was made. Probably another piece of film had some grain on it. Um, and so this now is uh, an image that shows just the film grain of the different strips. So I, I took the median of this 49 scans of the same strip and then that's one image here. And then the next strip, there's 49 strips of the same density. So this is now just an image of the grain itself plus the background image. So if we subtract away the background image, then we get just the, uh, the film grain itself. Um, so now this is if we subtract the background image from a single scan of a single strip. Um, that's going to contain both scanner and grain noise. So that's a lot higher, um, more intensity there. So if we compare these things, you can see on the, on the top here, this is the scanner and grain noise. This is just the grain noise and this is the scanner noise. You can see how different they look. Um, and so now we did some analysis of what is this, what is this, what are the grain, what are the noise characteristics? So we did a frequency analysis of these noises. Um, and we calculate the average frequency and magnitude of the noises using a spectral centroid. Um, and basically you can see the black, uh, the black line here is the scanner noise in the, the frequency domain. Um, the, the frequency of, the average frequency of the scanner noise is higher than the average frequency of the grain noise, which is here, which is the, the green line, um, and the magnitudes are different. And then, of course, the scanner plus grain noise is, is, is the worst case, right? Um, so then we can look at the IPs also. And so now we have samples of the noise doing the same exact thing. The samples of the grain on top, scanner plus grain, and then just scanner. Uh, for the negative and for the dry IP and for wet IP, you can see kind of how different they look, right? Um, they have different qualities. Um, so now, now we try to take this, but do the same type of frequency analysis, but also analyze the HDR outputs, which I can't show you because this is PowerPoint in 1080i. Um, but uh, I actually have the stuff I can show you if you want to contact me later. Um, so this is basically the analysis. I kind of got to hurry up here, but uh, we did a frequency analysis to calculate the average frequency and magnitude for each different type of noise um, for each different type of film element. Um, for, for, this is for patch 10. We did it for all the patches, all, pa all 17 patches. And when we plot the average frequency and the average noise magnitude uh, for the different patches, you can see how they change over time. Uh, not over time, over, uh, with patch density. Um, and so some key highlights are that the grain noise average frequency is lower for the dark uh, patches than the bright patches, and that's because larger grains are developed at low exposure. Um, scanner noise average frequency is higher than uh, the grain noise. And the average uh, magnitude of grain noise is significantly higher in the bright um, patches in HDR compared to SDR, and same for scanner noise. So this is the bright, these are the bright patches, and these are the dark patches, and in SDR, the, the noise is actually suppressed because it's basically rolled off and clipped, um, and it peaks in the mids in, in this particular uh, case. Um, and, but in HDR, the noise keeps going because the modulation keeps going. Um, so predicting the visibility. So trying to get back to the Barton model thing, um, taking this, um, <coughs> t 
to calculate the modulation detection threshold using the BART model, we calculate the average frequency like I was explaining for the, each type of noise and then we use the average patch luminance from this table of this output transform to give us a frequency and luminance at which to query the, the BART model for its uh, modulation detection threshold. We then calculated the modulation of the noise as two times the average magnitude of the noise because modulation is an amplitude from a max to min instead of uh, a magnitude is from max to average. So then we can calculate the, the, uh, the JNDs which is the modulation divided by the modulation detection threshold and that's plotted here for SDR and then I wanted to show you the picture here of what that noise looks like for this particular patch. So this is for the SDR outputs and you can see that the, the scanner and grain noise has nine JNDs of visibility. The grain noise alone, if we eliminate the scanner noise, has seven JNDs. The scanner noise is actually pretty significant in this case, has six JNDs. If we look at the, this is for the negative, for the dry IP, the scanner noise was lower, four JNDs. And of course, you can look at this for across all patches. Now, if we, we can just look at the graph in HDR, um, I can show it to you in the lab in actually the images and the samples themselves, but the, the story gets pretty, pretty bad for HDR uh, the getting the high, dense, high density uh, patches, um, they get pretty noisy. And so uh, in both a SDR and HDR for most patches, there's one, one JND less grain noise with the dry IP compared to the negative and one to two uh, JNDs less uh, with the wet IP compared to the negative. So, if you have a vault of film uh, and you have, you have different elements in there to pick from to remaster for HDR, they'll have different uh, characteristics of noise in the, in the pr pretty much across the board. Uh, for HDR, this, this, the, jan the, the noise is less with, uh, the scanner noise is less with IPs than negatives for the bright patches. You can see this divergence here. This is the negative scanner noise and this is the IP scanner noise. Um, so scanner noise can be eliminated by s doing multiple scans of the film. Now 49 is kind of crazy um, and no archivist would let you scan their film 49 times. Um, we made this film ourselves so we could destroy it that way. Um, it's part of why we use these boring patches also. Um, but um, anyway, the, a number of scans you need to eliminate noise is dependent on the noise magnitude. So the more noise there is, the more scans you'll need to eliminate the noise to, with the medium. Um, uh, so just to wrap up here, um, there's less grain noise with the dry IP and wet IP compared to the negative. There's less scanner noise with IPs than the negative. There's, the scanner noise can be eliminated with uh, some post-processing. I'm not done yet. Uh, and we expect the different scanners and different scan settings uh, could result in different scanner noise. And so that's the end. I have some images here just to show you uh, also. I want to show you because it's kind of interesting. This is an image of the scans. Um, the f four different things are basically, this is the background image of, of the, me the, this, the patch 10, the median of 45 strips and 49 scans, so 2,000 uh, data points there. This is the scanner noise. So this is now not zoomed in. So if you're, this is sort of natural zoom. So you can see the visibility uh, of this stuff. So this is, the, this is showing the scanner noise. This is the same piece of film scanned multiple times, um, presented here in a loop. And this, is the, um, this is what you'd get from a normal show, which is just, I'm doing a single scan of the, of the film. Um, it has both scanner noise and grain noise. And then this has got no scanner noise, it's just grain noise. And now if I subtract out this background image, it's kind of easier to see the noise. Um, depending on where you are in the room, you could probably not see this or see this. Um, this is the worst case, most visible, and this is medium, I'd say. Uh, this has no noise in it. And then this is all the patches, all 17 patches, uh, different, so this is the negative, uh, the dry IP and the wet IP, for, and so there's a scanner noise, scanner plus grain noise and just grain noise for the wet IP, for the dry IP, and for the negative across the different patches. And so you can see the visibility of the noise changes with the patch also. Anyway, that's uh, I think it. So.
There's 45 seconds for questions until coffee. So. Thank you. Maybe, maybe we can quickly take one. Uh, we don't really want to get into that, but it's it's a it's a real modern scanner. Oh, it was a double flash scanner, so that's partly why we saw the the scanner noise have this discontinuous behavior in the middle. I think but that's a good question, but it, it's not relevant to the work. It's a m method. We could test multiple scanners. Hey, just to be clear, I'd like to ask the same question 49 times. Um, <laughs> is there aesthetic value in the film grain that by analysis you can preserve or recover after you've... So, so um, you know, that's a creative question, obviously. I don't think, I mean, th that comes up often. I want to use this film, this condition to get this grain. Um, I've never heard anybody say, I want to have this scanner noise characteristic. It's the creatively important. So um, what, what, using the median, we can remove the scanner noise, which is kind of, and keep the grain noise. So I'm not proposing to eliminate grain noise. We could actually represent it faithfully if we scan better. Or presumably scan differently, since differently you don't. You, times. Your archivist probably objects to you dragging the film through the scanner, That's right. but staring at it, yep. different. Yeah, or, or not moving it and taking, you know, 49 images of it with a camera-based uh, thing. Definitely exactly. makes sense. Great. Also, the other problem that happens is facilities are focused on getting scans done, not spending two days making one scan. So it's a balance. Thank you. Okay, sorry, Scott. I'm going to have to cut it off. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you, Mike. And I would like to thank all the speakers. That will be the end of our sessions. And thank you all for joining.